Cloudcroft, New Mexico is the kind of small town that immediately conjures up images of a time when the West was a bit more wild. But today, about 700 people live in Cloudcroft, where the pace is relaxed and locals greet you with a smile instead of a six-shooter. People look out for one another, the businesses support each other, and it's just a great little community. It's a wonderful place to raise children and to vacation and relax. Relaxing is the big thing in Cloudcroft. But it seems Cloudcroft's rough and tumble past still lingers. And there's one place in town where the past meets the present just about every night. Welcome to the Lodge Resort and Spa in Cloudcroft, New Mexico. The Lodge is a full service resort. A lot of people just come up here to rest and relax. We have an outdoor heated swimming pool, we have a sauna, we have an exercise room, we have a day spa that we offer massages and treatments and pedicures, manicures, things of that sort. The lodge also boasts an 18-hole golf course and a fine dining establishment. Rebecca's is our fine dining restaurant and most of our guests that lodge here as well as people in the local area, about two hour drive market. They'll drive up just to have dinner at Rebecca's. The restaurant gets its name from a longtime resident at the lodge, who on special occasions has been known to make appearances out of thin air. I had sweaty palms, my heart was just racing, and I know that when I went to see the staff downstairs, I just had this frightened look on my face. I froze and my knees went weak, my legs went to, to jello, and I couldn't move and I couldn't speak, and my, the tips of my fingers were just shaking. I knew it was Rebecca. I felt her presence in this area, and I knew it was her immediately. The legend of Rebecca dates back to 1911, when the lodge at Cloudcroft was built. It became a destination spot for local loggers and socialites looking to escape the hot New Mexico heat. But the hotel's claim to fame was its housekeepers. Rebecca was a housekeeper here at the lodge and she took care of the rooms and the common areas, but she took care of a little more than that. She was what you might call a full service housekeeper. We also understand that she had evening duties and she took care of some of the locals and visitors in the area. Rebecca's promiscuous ways made her very popular among guests at the lodge. But Rebecca's extracurricular activities didn't go over so well with her lumberjack boyfriend. She really loved men, and she had a lumberjack boyfriend, and he worked out of town a lot. He wasn't here very often, and she entertained our guests, I could say. And one night, her boyfriend came back early from a logging trip. He asked where she was, and when he found out, he flew into a fit of jealous rage. <coughs> Legend says he cut off Rebecca's head and chopped up the rest of her body burying the remains somewhere on the property of the lodge and leaving behind a feisty red-headed spirit with no plans on leaving her favorite haunt. I 
was checking a function in this dining room behind us and doing a quick count on tables and chairs. And maybe 25 seconds in the room, I stepped out of the room and all three chandeliers on the mezzanine overlooking the lobby were swinging back and forth. Making believers out of hotel staff and guests seems to be a top priority for Rebecca's ghost. Those skeptical of her existence are often her favorite targets. I was training a new employee and we came over here to the coffee machine. We started brewing coffee. We went over here to the computer and I was training her on the computer. And she asked me about the ghost. I was a skeptic back then, <clears throat> and I, I shared that with her. And I said, but it's part of your job to know this. It's a bunch of bull, but you really need to share the story. At that time, now this is 15 feet away from the computer to the coffee maker. The basket with the grounds of coffee came flying at me all the way over here, hit me in the leg, hot water and hot gro coffee grounds exploded all over me. Before the two women could even speak, the doors to the room flew open, and a great rush of energy swarmed into the room, paralyzing them both with fear. Needless to say, that girl never came back the next day. I braved it out and came back, but um, it was quite terrifying. Rebecca had made her point, and once again had made believers out of the doubtful. Staff have learned the best way to deal with Rebecca is to acknowledge her presence. But that doesn't make them any less terrified. One night, an employee needed to fix a water pipe in the hotel's basement, and she refused to go alone. I enlisted the help of some young men who worked for me, who were in their late teens, 17, 18. And I had told them my stories of Rebecca, and they didn't really believe. In fact, they really laughed at the whole situation. As they reached the bottom of the stairs, Marty spoke aloud to Rebecca, as she had always done. I would say, I believe that you're here. I'm doing something to save water. I need to do this. Please, if you won't scare me, I won't bother you. Her young helper wasn't impressed. You could hear the young man laughing behind me. He thought it was ridiculous. So we got about halfway through the room. I was in front of him, and he was standing right off of my left shoulder. And he reached up in the pitch black, and he grabbed a hold of my shoulder. And you could literally tell that he was shaking from head to foot. He was so afraid that he, he, couldn't, he could hardly speak. The young man was led out of the basement, but couldn't relay what he had seen or experienced. One thing was certain, he wasn't laughing anymore. His face was stark white. His arms were white. He was afraid. And I told him, you, all you have to do is tell her that you believe that she's here, and she won't bother you. But he got a first-hand experience with the spirit of the lodge, and it made believers out of him. Perhaps Rebecca's bones are buried in the basement, and she doesn't like for her unmarked grave to be disturbed. And one night, Rebecca's lonely soul was seeking comfort from the living. We had a couple visiting here, overnighting with their little girl. And her name was Rebecca, and she was about six years old, long red hair, quite beautiful. And she was intrigued by the Rebecca story. The little girl asked her parents to read her Rebecca's tale before heading off to bed. Later on, about 10.30 at night, I was in the lobby, and all of a sudden, Rebecca, the little six-year-old Rebecca is walking 
and she's holding, it looks like she's holding someone's hand. And she's in her very beautiful white flowing nightgown and she's walking down the stairs and I said, Rebecca, what are you doing? And she says, oh, Rebecca came to the room, got me up and she's taking me on a stroll of the hotel. Does Rebecca long for a child of her own? Is she tied to the sight of her gruesome death? Whatever her reason for staying, just be sure to give your respects to the resident redhead at the lodge at Cloudcroft. The cost of ignoring her might not be worth the price you'll pay. Later, guests of North Carolina's Richmond Hill Inn may take home more than just memories. There is a presence so strong in this room. I can feel it. I'm, I feel as if I'm going to, you know, bump into them. But next, palm trees and warm weather can't mask the terror going on inside this Florida hotel. It's like footsteps coming, walking along in the room and doors opening. Hundreds of beach resorts line Florida's coast. But in the northeast corner of the state sits a beach town like no other. It's the country's oldest continuously inhabited city. It's St. Augustine. And aside from its year-round sunshine, this city is famous for its haunted history. of the people and all of the different cultures who've lived in this city over five centuries. And most of St. Augustine's ghost stories come from its bloody past. There's the oldest military fort in the country where ghostly soldiers still stand guard. Or the Spanish military hospital where death and disease still linger within its walls and the old city jail museum, where violent criminals are eternally locked up. It seems like in St. Augustine, every tourist site has a ghostly tale attached. In fact, you won't even have to leave your hotel room to come face to face with its haunted past. We just don't have run of the mill ghosts. We have America's finest spirits right here in St. Augustine and its most famous haunts called the luxurious Casablanca Inn home. And this is a special place in St. Augustine. The house is old. The bay is beautiful. Lots of people coming here all the time and almost anybody that comes here, they're in happy spirits. But not all the spirits here are happy ones. Legend tells us the inn wasn't always the charming getaway it is today, but a dangerous den of criminal activity. The time was the 1920s, prohibition had just passed, and St. Augustine was a hotbed for smugglers who were bringing in rum from the Caribbean. They called themselves rum runners. Not everybody was doing well in the 19-teens and the 1920s, and rum running was a quick and easy way to make money. But it wasn't so easy. Rum runners faced countless dangers, whether it was the perilously shallow reefs of the Caribbean or the deadly storms that struck the Florida coast. But the gravest danger of all came from those put in charge of enforcing prohibition laws the infamous G-Men. Some of you will remember the days of Elliot Ness and the federal agents, they would come in town and if anybody was caught with, with liquor, you know, they would be arrested. Dedicated G-Men under the direction of the notorious Elliot Ness were hot on the trail of the rum runners entering the port of St. Augustine. But the innocent looking young widow who owned the Casablanca Inn wasn't so innocent after all. We feel quite certain that she was conspiring against the government boys, the revenuers, who were trying to catch the rum runners who came into the bay. It's a lady after my heart, because she decided she was going to make money. 
Well, she made a deal with some of the rum runners. You know, you pay me, and you know, I'll let you know when the government men are around. She was a shrewd businesswoman and bold. She would then have the statesmen that came into the city to look for all of these illegal events. She would have them stay here. The innkeeper would give the G-men misleading information about the rum runners. Then once the agents stepped out the front door, she let the rum runners in through the back. But how would the rum runners not get caught as they sailed into port? If it wasn't safe to come into town, she'd signal the rum runners to stay out at sea by waving a lantern. The men would sail by undetected and move on up the coast. So it worked out really well. She made a fortune doing it. The rum runners operated from the inn, selling the contraband liquor and boarding here while they were in town. Her only downfall, she actually fell in love with one of the rum runners. One night, after the party died down and they were left alone, they kissed goodbye, as they always did, promising to see each other once again. But the next time her lover was due in town, the G-men had arrived. As always, the innkeeper climbed the stairs to the widow's walk with her lantern. She waved her lover off. She knew that the government men were in town and she didn't want him to land. She stood atop the inn, and though the wind was howling off the water, she waved her lantern, warning her lover of the danger. Only another danger lurked in the darkness of the sea. Unfortunately, of course, in those days, there was no way of predicting a hurricane. Story goes, as I've heard it, that there's a horrible storm. He was supposed to come, and she was up there waving. He never showed up. The innkeeper waited faithfully for her lover's return. While their romance was brief, their love was strong, and she couldn't bear the thought of never seeing him again. After months of waiting, reality set in. He was lost at sea in the storm, and she never recovered from the heartache. Today, guests at the Casablanca Inn enjoy sherry on the porch without fear of being hunted by the G-men. They get a beautiful two-course gourmet breakfast each morning. Our guests can help themselves to drinks in the kitchen, homemade chocolate chip cookies every single day. There's always cream sherry out. The historic Casablanca Inn enjoys the reputation of being one of St. Augustine's premier properties. But spend the night, and you'll see the past is never far behind. We checked into our room, and there was stuff about ghost tours and ghost this and ghost that. And just in my mind, I just kind of laugh. I think it's kind of a big joke. It's pretty funny. And then the TV went on. But neither the man nor his wife had turned it on. And then she went over towards the TV, and she says, well, if you're a good ghost, turn the TV off. And the TV went off. <laughs> and then I'd say like maybe 30, 40 seconds later, TV went back on. Whether the spirit is a good ghost or bad ghost is yet to be decided. Michael, who is our innkeeper at nighttime, was sitting in this room one night. All of a sudden, he thought he heard somebody upstairs. The commotion startled the innkeeper as there was no guest staying in the room above. So he sat there and he listened, you know, and he heard it again. It was like footsteps coming, walking along in the room. When doors opening. The innkeeper quickly grabbed the room keys, ran up the stairwell, and approached the doorway. He opened the doors and he searched the room completely and there was nobody there. Nobody. 
Though he found no trace of a disturbance, he felt a presence, like someone was in the room with him. And he got so spooked, he said he was wide awake all night that night. He got really scared. But perhaps the eeriest proof that the former innkeeper and her rum runners continue their clandestine relationship from beyond is experienced not by the guests of the hotel, but by passers-by late at night. And people in the next uh, inn, the Casa de la Paz, have woken up thinking it was a lighthouse. And they were like, oh, how quaint, how beautiful. Look up, and it was coming from across at the Casa Blanca. The phenomenon has even shown up in photographs taken by unsuspecting vacationers. Someone took a picture one time, and, uh, and there was nothing there. And the light came out in the picture. Is the lady with the lantern still guiding the shadowy vessels of Prohibition's underworld away from danger? Or is she still hoping to be reunited with her love? forever doomed to a watery grave. Little things that happen and then it makes you wonder, you know, is there somebody here who's still attached to the house somehow? Stay the night at the Casablanca Inn and you won't be the only one who doesn't want to leave. Coming up, visitors and staff at this Chicago hotel relive a young woman's suicide every night. She went up to the roof of the drag but first, there's something strange living within this mountainside inn. It's usually about 2 in the morning. Um, they hear a sort of a, a dragging or a, a wagon being pulled across the floor. Romance is the theme of Asheville, North Carolina's Richmond Hill Inn. But whether you're dining by candlelight, putting on the croquet fields, or simply lounging in your room, the threat of a ghostly encounter is around every corner. Walking up on a third level is always very nerve-wracking. Goosebumps, head to toe, you're very alert. I would say, do you feel anything in this room? There is a presence so strong in this room. I can feel it. I'm, I feel as if I'm going to, you know, bump into them. The Richmond Hill Inn is a very cozy, intimate environment. And that means that usually when ghostly occurrences happen, people see them at a rather close range. But close encounters of the ghostly kind don't seem to scare away hotel guests. Richmond Hill was built in 1889 and served as a family home until it fell vacant in the 1970s. It was purchased and renovated as a luxurious inn 100 years after its construction. The Richmond Hill Inn is a, a very majestic place. Um, beautiful gardens, beautiful grounds, um, elegant across the board. Not to mention a picturesque view of the Blue Ridge Mountains. To come out every morning and just look across the mountain and see the beautiful trees and the rolling hills, it's breathtaking. I think once you come, you'll want to stay. Evidently, Richmond Hill's ghosts feel the same way. When I started working here, I had heard a few rumors from coworkers of things happening, um, strange occurrences, everything for the most part benevolent, uh, but some startling. It's believed the home's original owners, the Pearson family, have refused to leave, even long after their deaths. When guests arrive at Richmond Hill, they first come into the Oak Hall of the mansion. And as they go into, come into the Oak Hall, they first notice some large portraits on the wall of Richmond Pearson and Gabrielle Pearson, the builders of Richmond Hill. 
the Richmond Hill Inn was, was built in 1889 by Richmond and Gabrielle Pearson. Uh, Richmond Pearson was a, a U.S. congressman and an ambassador to Persia, Greece, and Italy. Originally, uh, Richmond Hill was um, sort of rather self-sufficient. It had a farm area. It had servants to take care of the house as well. They moved here and became quite socially active in Asheville. This was a social hub of in Asheville. The Pearsons and their three children were the epitome of a happy family. But I can imagine being a child here. It would have been a lovely place to have played and uh, with all the outdoors and the mountains and the trees and the river down below. But the family's happiness was not meant to last. At the age of 14, Richmond Pearson Jr. fell ill with scarlet fever. It was one of those deadly childhood diseases. Back then, we didn't have the antibiotics that we do now. And, and, um, and many of the mothers and fathers expected or knew children would die. And it still is a tragedy, even then. Scarlet fever took the boy's life. And with his death, the fairy tale world of the Pearsons came to an abrupt end. In 1989, their former home was converted to an inn, thus awakening the dormant spirits of the long-dead Pearsons. People talk about a lot of physical effects, such as a leg being grabbed or an ankle being grabbed in the middle of the night. And they also describe uh, dark, shadowy forms, sort of dark silhouettes. I had a couple that stayed for four nights a few years back over the 4th of July. I was told by them that right before falling asleep, the lady felt as though something grabbed her ankle. And she turned over because she thought her husband had, had touched her. He was turned the opposite way, sound asleep. Was it the ghost of the building's former sickly child? Or simply an act of imagination? While we'll never know for sure, one thing is for certain at the Richmond Hill Inn. Guests spending the night in the former bedrooms of the founding family go home with a vacation tale they'll never forget. One day I was in there hanging up two bathrobes in the closet where her picture is hung across from the closet. And I shut the door, and about time I got back to my cart, I saw this white, like, swoosh thing go toward the closet. And I went back directly to the closet, and when I opened the closet door, it was tremendous heat coming out of that closet something from the wall where her picture hung moved to that closet. But perhaps the most prolific ghost of the Richmond Hill Inn lives in today's F. Scott Fitzgerald room. The room is probably the focal point of the reports we get here at Richmond Hill. Spend a night here and you just might get the scare of your life. It's usually about two in the morning. Um, they hear a sort of a, a dragging or a, a wagon being pulled across the floor. Um, several times I've had guests tell me about the ball being bounced.
Staff believe it is young Richmond Jr. seeking to relive the years before his fatal illness ruined his happy home. I think it's Richmond Pearson Jr. I think he's up there playing. I think he wanted someone to play with. I really sense he wants somebody to play with. And as in life, it seems the ghostly Mrs. Pearson, accompanied by her son, continue to watch over their home for all of eternity. I think they did enjoy living here. I think they crossed over to, an, to the other side, but something drew them back to this house. So if you're looking for a romantic getaway, you wouldn't be the first to choose the Richmond Hill Inn. But skeptics beware. If you're a skeptic, stay here at the Richmond Hill Inn, and you just might have your mind changed for you. Coming up, there's no rest for the weary at Louisiana's haunted Artesia Manor. I didn't believe this until it actually happened to me. But next, the ghosts are more demanding than the guests at this Chicago hotel. He just went white. I was like, what, is somebody standing behind me? What, you know, tell me. Chicago is known as the Windy City. And though a cold wind often howls off Lake Michigan, Chicago's nickname might be best suited for its lesser known attributes. Like the ghosts said to haunt the dark recesses of the city's most famous hotel. If you were a ghost looking for a great haunt, you'd be hard pressed to find nicer digs than Chicago's Drake Hotel. If I were a ghost, I would think the Drake would be a fabulous place to spend the rest of eternity. You have every convenience. It's plush, it's beautiful, you're on the beach. Not much more you need in life. Or death. <laughs> but when modern day and otherworldly guests collide, it can make for a frightening stay. and all the hair on our arms and, and uh, the back of our head stood up. And uh, the candle blew out. You could really feel it, I mean, it was palpable. The idea for the Drake Hotel was born in 1920. Chicago was in need of a major luxury hotel, and hotel entrepreneurs John and Tracy Drake were up to the task, to the tune of $10 million. The building was designed by renowned architect Ben Marshall and has retained every bit of its imperial elegance. The Drake is now a Chicago landmark. The Drake lobby, I think, is the depiction of the classic image of what a hotel lobby should be. You walk in and yeah, that's what hits you first, is the grandness of the lobby, the beautiful floral display in the center, the harp music coming from the palm court, the fountains. So you're kind of walking into a, a piece of elegance. It's a great experience. The Drake's elegance has always been its calling card. At the height of its opulence in the 1920s, the hotel played host to high society balls in its famous Gold Coast room. We'll try to picture 1920 in Chicago when the hotel opened. Uh, this was the only building here. The Lakeshore Drive was not out there. We were on the beach. The Gold Coast Room, our most grand of the ballrooms, uh, faces huge windows, 24-foot ceiling windows. And the ceiling, in fact, was retractable, so you could have your dancing under the stars. Most guests had so much fun at the legendary balls, they never wanted to leave. I've been working at the desk where guests have come to the desk and inquire if, uh, if something's going on in the ballroom. I think they're talking about an event or they're thinking of a wedding, they want to view the room. So I'll say, let me check if there's a a function going on or one scheduled. And they'll say, no, what's going on in the ballroom? 
because they had gone in there and felt watched and uncomfortable and actually left. The spirit thought to be responsible for causing the most discomfort at the Drake Hotel is known as the Lady in Red. The story begins at one of the grand balls held at the Drake in the 1920s. The details of that night are blurry, but the tragic ending is quite clear. Something upset her um, after she was attending a ball. She went up to the roof of the Drake and then she jumped off. People say that's why she's kind of hovering around the 10th floor, the top floor of the hotel. Where her spirit is said to remain to this day. The mystery surrounding her death is only matched by the mystery of her appearances at the Drake. The Lady in Red has a way of letting you know she's lurking nearby, just in time to disappear. Like most guests at the Drake, the Lady in Red expects nothing but the best in service during her stay, and has even lodged complaints with management. A few years ago, a big budget Hollywood film was being shot at the Drake Hotel. So late at night they were filming um, up and obviously making some noise and the security department got a phone call from a woman and it said, can you please ask them to stop? They're making too much noise. They're bothering me. All phone calls made from within the Drake have their own unique four digit extension that can be traced to a specific room. But the guest phoning in this particular complaint would prove to be more of a long distance call. And the extension was from our 10th floor but it didn't exist. So when they went to check the extension, it literally was an old closet room. And there was no phone in there. Security guards at the Drake insisted a woman called from the non-existent extension. And sightings of the Lady in Red continue to this very day, leaving even the most skeptical of the staff at the Drake grasping for an explanation. Some of these stories that have come, you know, repeatedly through totally unknown guests, you know, to each other over the years have proved to be very coincidental and hard to explain any other ways. The historic Drake Hotel prides itself on catering to the demands of its high-class clientele. But how do they handle guests concerned about supernatural squatters sharing the facilities? They mostly find it kind of humorous, and if you can validate some of these stories, they kind of lighten up and get titillated by it, perhaps, but it never seems to have been a negative, you know, nobody too frightened or alarmed or inconvenienced, but it's curious, to say the least. <laughs> curious travelers can plan a stay at the Drake Hotel, where every night has the potential to be a ball. Coming up, something once out of Louisiana's Artesia Manor. Police call you in the middle of the night. Um, can you come over to Artesia because every door is wide open. Located about 40 miles north of New Orleans, the town of Abita Springs, Louisiana was originally a destination for city dwellers looking to improve their health. Its waters were believed to be magical and could heal even the most ill patients. Doctors began to prescribe people to come to Abita Springs if they had uh, lung ailments like tuberculosis or if they had yellow fever. Today, modern medicine has replaced the need for healing springs. But according to locals, there may still be something in the water because the mystical spirits have even seeped into the ground of the town's most cherished estate. Welcome to Artesia Manor. Uh, everyone that's worked here, it eventually seems to have something happen. 
was just two or three people here or you're by yourself, that's when you would really feel the presence of somebody else there. I hated being here alone. Artesia is considered to be haunted by most all of the staff and anyone that's ever worked here. They have always felt a strong presence, especially in the upstairs dining area, which was the original hotel. Artesia Manor offers guests fine dining in its restaurant and a relaxing night in the countryside in their quaint guest cottages. While guests appreciate the cottage's quaint charm, the hotel was meant to be much bigger. Its original owner, a likable, ambitious man named Frank Leno, had grand designs for the property. He spent each day planning for his home's future. But before Frank could cash in on the area's healing springs, Frank Leno met an untimely and mysterious end. The last time anybody saw Mr. Frank Linnell, he was leaving the hotel and walking towards Abita Springs. Nobody ever saw or heard from him since then. Did he wander off into the woods, never to return? Or, as some suspect, was he murdered? Regardless of how he died, those who have spent a good amount of time at Artesia Manor insist that Frank Leno has never really left. I think Frank's ghost makes rounds at Artesia, and I think that he checks things to make sure that things are okay. Being the owner of Artesia comes with its own set of unique challenges. Lights turn on and off. Smoke alarms are tripped in the middle of the night. Every morning at 9.40, the telephone briefly disconnects. You lock the doors in the morning, the doors are open, the police call you in the middle of the night. Um, can you come over to Artesia because every door is wide open. For some reason, Frank's ghost seems to prefer the doors to Artesia be left open. But Frank's feisty spirit doesn't just hide in the shadows, causing mischief. I had a waitress one time, came in the kitchen, it was right before we opened. And she came in and told us there was a man out front. Someone goes to see what he needed. The staff was startled to discover the guest didn't have a reservation. In fact, there were no signs he had been there at all. The weird thing was the, the doors, the exits were all locked. So there's no way there was someone in there. Frank's ghost seems to believe that intimidation is the best way to motivate employees at Artesia Manor. It makes me very uneasy to be here alone work. I'll, I'll always have music on or I'm talking to the ghost, telling him I'm finishing up my work and I'm leaving, I'll leave the place to him. But if the stories are true, Frank isn't the only ghost keeping a watchful eye on Artesia Manor. There was a French woman that came to stay at the property, and she was a guest at the property. And she fell in love with it, and she decided to stay. The woman lived out the rest of her life as the manager of Artesia. After her death, some say she decided to remain behind. Nanette was the general manager at Artesia for three years, and she always felt a strong um, feminine presence. While the men, Brian and some of the other employees, have actually felt the masculine um, presence. While the female ghost seems to be friendlier than her male counterpart, neither make working at the Artesia Manor any less eerie. I didn't believe this when I first started working here until it actually happened to me. And now I'm a firmer believer that it happens. 
The community was such a popular health resort. So many people visited here and so many things happened that it would be almost impossible for us not to have hauntings. Though Abita Springs no longer attracts visitors for its purifying waters, one should never underestimate the healing power of a good scare. Next on Discovery Travel and Living, find out if Cash can survive alone with no money and no place to stay in Cuba PD in the Aussie Outback. We're stranded with Cash Peters after the break.